George Crane is a pastor and newspaper columnist, and he shared the story, a true story, of a woman who came into his office for counseling, and she said that she was at a point where she wanted to leave her husband. And she said, I just don't want to get rid of him. I want him to feel the pain that I have felt for so many years. And he said, all right. He said, well, you want to get him back? And she said, oh, I do. He said, well, let me tell you how to do it. Will you really make him feel your pain? Yes. He said, well, I want you to go home, and for the next two months, I want you to act as though you really do love him. And this is a true story. You really do love him. That means that you're going to do everything possible to love him as much as you possibly can. You, you affirm, you praise his attributes. You show love and consideration. You listen to him. You affirm him. You, you serve him in every possible way. You want to convince him and make him believe that you really do love him. And at that very moment, then you drop the bomb. You tell him that you want to get a divorce. And she said, that's perfect. I can't wait. And so she left with revenge in her eyes and went home. For the next two months, she did exactly what that pastor told her to do. And two months had passed, and she didn't come back to his office. So he called her and he said, are you ready to file for divorce? And she said, divorce? She said, I, I can't believe that I discovered how much I really do love him. Now what happened? Her actions changed her feelings. She wanted her feelings to change toward her husband, but nothing changed until she did something. She started acting in love toward him. Now, I want to show you today from God's Word how loving God and loving others is not only going to give you spiritual confidence, but spiritual power. How you can have an unshakable faith, and, and God makes it very clear in His Word today. So, I want you to open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Now, for those who are guests... I preached the first half of this message two weeks ago. Uh, we took a hiatus with Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. And it is custom in particularly this book. You know, I preached through different books. I don't know. I counted it up the other day. Probably 20 or 25 books of the Bible I've already preached through. Uh, but this is different in that the passages, the theme of the passage is longer. And so I'm trying to get the full context of what's being said. But I don't have enough time to do it in one setting. So again, this is why this message was split up the way that it was. And I'm going to review the first two points of the message. Then most of the time I'm going to spend on the third point that you have in your notes today. But again, John is really giving us very practical advice and insight on the importance and what happens. And, and really what does it prove about your faith as it relates to loving God particularly by loving others. So 1 John 3, I'm going to start in verse 10, the latter half of that verse. He says, Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, we should love one another. Unlike Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. The one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Now, of course, he's talking about an unrepentant murderer. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need but shuts off his compassion from him, how can God's love reside in him? Little children, we must not love in word or speech, but in deed and truth. That is how we will know we are of the truth and will convince our hearts in his presence. Because if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and can receive whatever we ask from Him because we keep His commands and do what is pleasing in His sight. 
Now this is his command, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commands remains in him, and he in him. And the way we know that he remains in us is from the spirit he has given us. Three aspects of God's love. Let's review the first two. Number one, notice the command to love. John gives this command that we should love one another, which is foundational to the Christian message. The whole concept of love, which begins with God's love, uh, that, that, that love comes from God first of all. We love God because he first loved us. But the way that we know that we have God's love translates into loving others. If we don't love others, we don't have the love of God. So he gives that command. Now, this is foundational. Previously, he says that we're to uh, no longer live a life of habitual sin. And now he's saying you need to live a life of habitual love. And he illustrates this with the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4. As you know the story, Abel offered a sacrifice to God that was acceptable. Cain's was not because of his evil heart. And as a result, Cain killed Abel. Now, Cain had the absence of love. And why did he murder him? Here he exposes, John does, Cain's motives. He says, because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. The whole idea of Abel being a righteous individual is the key to understanding what he's saying here. He was, Cain was jealous of his brother's acts of righteousness. So what happens? Jealousy leads to hatred or anger, which leads to murder. Murder in the heart, of the heart, or uh, physically. And why does that happen? Because the evil person hates righteousness. They hate it. God will convict them uh, of, of their evil heart towards someone else. Uh, that, that, that something becomes very evident. And that makes them feel uncomfortable. It makes them feel bad. They know down deep inside that that feeling is not right. It's wrong. But instead of repenting of that sin and loving that individual, they try to do everything they can to remove the discomfort. So they end the friendship, the relationship. They become mean, angry, hatred. They bully them. They torment them. They, 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 they get others around them to do the same. They try to isolate themselves from that individual and sometimes even murder that person. Now, here's the problem. They don't like the good that is in the righteous person. But more importantly and far greater is they don't like the good that God is doing in that person's life. So your problem of jealousy is not just a problem with that individual, it's a problem with God. That your anger is actually directed toward God. That you're mad at Him for what He's doing in their life and not doing in your life. So He drops the hammer and doesn't say, oh, jealousy is just a, you know, it's something we deal with. He says, this is serious business with God because it really shows the evil intent of the heart and that's what happened to Cain. He acted on what was in him. His evil intent was because of his evil desire. Now notice verse 13. He ties and he continues the thought. Don't be surprised, brothers, if the world hates you. If you live a rich, righteous life like Abel, the world's going to hate you. There are going to be people who act like Cain. The Cains are going to pop up. They're going to show up. So don't be surprised by that when the world is hating you. And it's a confirmation of your faith. Verse 14, he says, we know that we've passed from death to life. We sang about it just a moment ago. We've moved from death to life because of the righteousness of Christ. He's saying here, the proof of you moving from death to life is not just the righteousness of Christ, but it's the way that you treat others. It's the love. That righteousness of Christ, if he's in your heart, will cause you to love those who don't love you. To cause you to love others in a way that pleases God. So loving others is evidence of that transition. The absence of love indicates a person is still in death. Spiritual death. Now notice verse 15. He gives the summary of this whole point. Which says that the person who hates his brother is actually a murderer and is not a believer. Notice the second point is the description of love. So if I'm supposed to love others 
and uh, love God and love others, then what kind of love is he talking about? Well, first of all, he's talking about sacrificial love. Notice verse 16. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers. Christ is the example. I read again this week, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. That was the passage of Scripture that was being preached on a Sunday night in my father's church. Where he was the pastor. Uh, and uh, it, it was an amazing thing. By the way, i got to say this. I didn't think of it until this morning when I was at this point. Monday, I called my dad. Every Monday we talk. We talk about preacher stuff, what happened on Sunday. And, you know, if he's speaking somewhere, he'll tell me about it. And I, I said, hey, Dad. He said, hey, just a minute. Somebody wants to say hi to you. And he handed the phone. And you know who it was? Gary Taylor, the guy who preached the sermon over 50 years ago when I gave my heart to Christ. On Mondays, once a month, he gets about a dozen preachers and they meet together and uh, he mentors them. And uh, Gary said, hey, Mark. I said, man, Gary is so great. Then we talked for a few moments. But here's the verse. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you follow in his steps. All right? So Christ left us an example, not of being a good moral person. What was the example? His suffering. His sacrificial love that led to his suffering, that led to the cross. And so that's the example of love that we're to have toward others. Love is also practical. Verse 17, if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, but shuts off his compassion from him, how can God's love reside in him? John is showing the practical way in which we love others. Now, again, as I mentioned, he moved from brothers to brother. And I want to quote B.P. Lewis again. He says, it is easier to be enthusiastic about humanity with a capital H than it is to love individual men and women, especially those who are uninteresting, exasperating, depraved, or otherwise unattractive. Loving everybody in general may be an excuse for loving no one in particular. Oh, well, I, I, I love everybody, or I love the church, or I love, you know, whatever. I love my people at work. Well, that doesn't mean anything unless you're loving an individual. How does that translate into that individual? So helping hurting people is evidence in practical ways that I love God. Love is also consistent. He says, little children, we must not love in word or speech, but in deed and truth. We can't be hypocritical about our faith. Our love and the demonstration of our love is not something we do when we're gathered with God's people once a week. It's every day. It's in the, the drudgery of life when all hell's coming against us. It's hard to love others. That's when we are showing God's love. Notice also now the third point as we'll get to the main point of the message today. So he's given us you know, what it means to love, the command to love, the description of love. So is it really worth it? Now he'll show us the blessings of love. What good comes to us if we love God and love others? Notice, first of all, is assurance of salvation. Now, what I'm getting ready to talk about here is very important in understanding how to have spiritual confidence rather than being a spiritual coward, how to have power and boldness in your faith. All right, so here's where he really drills down on that. He says that, that the blessing of love is, first of all, assurance of salvation. Verse 19, this is how we will know we are of the truth, that we're believers, and we'll convince our hearts in his presence. He's saying our love is evidence that we possess the truth. To know is not meaning intellectual knowledge, it's meaning experiential knowledge. That I have experienced the power of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ, the grace of Christ in my life. And so now I'm in a position to receive that blessing. I, I, I have experienced salvation. And he says that that will convince our hearts. It will give us the assurance of our relationship to God. The assurance of our salvation. Verse 20, great verse. Because if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Now, this could be translated in one of two ways. One way is that God will convict us that we do not love others in order to prevent us from becoming like Cain, to having that evilness in our heart. 
And so we confess that, we repent of that. God knows all things. He knows what's going on in that situation. And, and, and if we know that, then that causes us to be accountable to God for our sin. The other way that that can tra be translated kind of has a different twist on it. That we're often guilty of self-condemnation, meaning that we've been convicted, we have confessed our sin, but we cannot forgive ourselves. We listen to our heart that, that condemns us, even though God has said that we are forgiven. And he says that God knows all things, meaning that he knows the condition of our heart at that moment of self-condemnation, but God is greater than our heart in that he's merciful. Yes, I'm accountable for sin, but more than that, I'm able to experience the mercy of God when I experience those feelings of self-condemnation. We may question whether or not we love someone adequately, and we feel guilty about that. And God says that we have been forgiven and that we can overcome those kinds of feelings. Now, to continue to be victimized by a heart of self-condemnation is really a sophisticated form of idolatry. That I believe myself more than I believe God. I'm accepting what myself is saying to me, which I'll show you later who's really saying that. Rather than what God has said about me. None of us want to believe that we're living an adult, uh, adulterous life, adulterous life, but we are if, if our life is centered around us and what we think and what we believe. Shakespeare wrote, conscience makes cowards of us all. Well, that is true until God overrules our hearts and we believe what he says and we're cowards no more. Tennyson has Sir Galahad say, I have strength of ten men because of my pure heart. I would say that I have the strength of ten men because I have confessed my sin before the Lord and that I'm trying to love God by loving others and therefore I have spiritual strength and spiritual power. That is the cure for all spiritual cowardice. So love in that way gives us assurance of our salvation but not only that another blessing of love is the assurance in prayer verse 21 dear friends if our hearts do not condemn us we have confidence before God when we practice love we experience power in our prayer life the word confidence there means we have boldness and we have freedom before God an intimate relationship with him confidence doesn't mean that I can command God to do what he what I want him to do but it does mean that I trust him I trust his sovereignty I trust his grace his character that he's going to respond to that prayer and now sometimes people will say well God doesn't hear my prayer well that's not true the Bible says that he does hear your prayer the psalmist says that God not only hears our prayers but he answers them as well and so we know that he'll do that. Sometimes it's, I'm going to wait before I respond to that prayer. It's an immediate yes or an immediate no. But we can be confident that God is at work. And if we're loving God and loving others, it gives us the assurance. Because here's what he says, verse 22. And because we can receive whatever we ask from him. So he's saying that if you go to God in prayer and you're living this life of loving God and loving others then you can have confidence that God is going to respond to you and you can ask him whatever you, you, you feel like you need. Now notice that there's a condition. He says, because we keep his commands and do what is pleasing in his sight. We just can't live a life of disobedience. We can't have anger in our heart toward others in the context of the sermon, the passage here, and expect God to answer our prayers. Love leads to obedience, which leads to answered prayer. Jesus said in John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He said in John 15, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. And notice he says, and if you do what is pleasing in his sight. That means that I, I just... In, naturally respond 
to the issues of life in a way that pleases God. I don't have to go home and pray about it for hours or days or weeks or months. I don't have to call somebody up, what should I do in this situation? I do what is pleasing to me. It's a spontaneous response uh, to God in obedience in that moment. And by that, it shows that I, we have love toward him. Those who live to please God, listen, you'll discover this, that God wants to please you. He'll, ple he'll please you. The psalmist says, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Now, here's, here's the point I want to make about spiritual confidence. I have found that people who, who have an issue with another person, who have bitterness, who have anger, hatred toward another person, have powerless prayer lives. How can you go before God? If they do pray, how can you go before God and expect God to do anything in your life if, if, you're, if you have an unforgiving heart? What does he say about worship? If you come to worship and before you give your gift, if you have something against someone else, leave your gift at the altar, go make it right and come back to worship. The same principle applies to prayer. If a person is really serious about their prayer life, God will convict them of their sin, of anger or hatred or bitterness or jealousy towards someone else, and they'll deal with it. They'll confess that, they'll repent of that sin, and they'll try to reconcile, they'll try to make that right. But often, the person who has bitterness, anger toward their heart, they have a hard time praying. Some will come in and they'll say, well, I just don't feel much power in my prayer life. And on occasion, sometimes a person will say, after we really get down into it and drill down, they'll say, I've, I've got this issue with this other person. And, but once that is dealt with, then there's absolute freedom in their prayer life, boldness and confidence, power in their prayer life. So you can have assurance in prayer when you're loving God and loving others. Look, if you've got somebody, something against somebody, you're going to have doubt in your prayer life. If you're really saved... Because you know that this isn't the way it works. I've got to deal with this. Notice also another blessing is the assurance with Christ. Verse 23. Now this is his command that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he, com and as he commanded us. Now remember in Matthew 25, uh, Jesus gave us the two commands, the two great commands. What did he say? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, he said it right here. You need to have faith in Christ, and you need to have love toward others. Paul says this in Galatians 5. What matters is faith working through love. How do I know the evidence of faith? It's by the way it's working through love. It's the attitude of the heart. How does God really know that we love him? It's our faith working through love. It's the attitude of our heart toward him and toward others. Now notice verse 24, the one who keeps his commands remains in him and he in him. Keeping his commands allows us to stay close to the Lord. In John 15, some people misinterpret John 15 as a chapter on salvation. But it's a chapter about believers who are bearing fruit. Who are bearing fruit. That means looking like Christ. We enter into a union with Christ at salvation and then we stay in communion with him, bearing Christ's likeness. We become little Christ, as C.S. Lewis said. That's what's happening. And so we're trying to be like Christ, emulate, follow in his steps. He set the example for us. All that depends on obedience. Jesus said in John 14, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Here in verse 24, he says, and we know that we... And the way we know that he remains in us is from the spirit he has given us. When we're in a relationship with God, this mutual abiding relationship through Christ, then the evidence is the Holy Spirit at work in our life. We sense the spirit. The spirit is moving us, drawing us, convicting us, guiding us. So as the scripture says, so we sense that happening. All right. Notice it's from the spirit. Our assurance comes from God's Spirit that He has given us. That comes to us at the moment of salvation. The Spirit of Christ comes in. 
So, when we love others, we're blessed with assurance of salvation, assurance in prayer, and assurance in Christ. Let me give you some summary statements that will help you, all right, as we close today. Number one, if you love God and love others, you have confidence about your salvation. You don't have to worry about it. You know, somebody will come in and they'll say, I'm doubting my salvation. And usually it's somebody who had a childhood experience and they're questioning whether that was really legitimate or not. You know, in some cases, you know, and I always do, I go back to that moment, but the real issue is this. Do you love God? Yes. Do you love others? Yes. Do you desire to please God? Yes. Are you trying to do what is right based on his commands? Yes. What makes you think you're not a Christian? I mean, you're showing the evidence of that. So loving God and loving others is the confidence that you need, the spiritual confidence that you have things right with God. Secondly, if you love God and others, you have confidence to live in freedom. That means there's no guilt, no shame, no condemnation. Listen, you cannot trust what your heart says about you, but you can trust what God says about you. Now, here's, the, here's, the, here's why that's true. Satan appeals to your emotions, your feelings, your heart. God appeals to your mind, to your will, to what is true. I've said this before, but you know, so many people, may, and I'm guilty as anyone, of making decisions based on how we feel rather than fact, what is true. And so Satan will say to you, that you're unworthy to experience God's love. That you're unworthy to be forgiven of that sin. And so we believe the lie. And our heart condemns us. But instead we need to believe what God has said. And God overrides all that. So the Spirit convicts us. And then we respond by faith and obedience. And you can live in freedom from all the lies of Satan. So loving God and loving others gives you confidence to live in freedom. And third, if you love God and others, you'll have confidence to do His will. You will possess the truth. You'll know what to do. You will have power to do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can't do everything you want to do. God doesn't play that game. But everything that I should do, if I'm able to know God's will, then I'm able to do God's will. That's what it means I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have the power, the strength to accomplish God's will through my life. And you'll have the perseverance to experience victory, not just in eternity, but right now in the middle of the mess. Your circumstance may not change today. It may not ever change. It may or may not. But how you respond to that will be the key. God can give you the victory today to get through what it is that you're experiencing. There are too many examples in Scripture. I don't have time to get into them all. Of those who had circumstances that did not change. Now listen. This It's what the Bible means when we're able to have spiritual power, spiritual confidence, and not live in spiritual cowardice. Are you living in spiritual cowardice or spiritual confidence today? Why don't you bow your head and close your eyes? There might be somebody here today who would say, Pastor, I don't know if I've ever truly experienced God's love the way that you described it. I know that I've sinned, and I know that I'm not close to God, but I want to be close to God. I want to have a relationship with Him. And that can happen today as you give your heart to Christ. And what I mean by that is that you believe that Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin, that He took care of your unrighteousness by the righteousness of Christ, and that you can turn from sin and self And turn to Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. That's called repentance. And by doing that, 
not just believing him as your savior but as your lord you're willing to follow him with your life you can begin a new journey of faith with god today now you may not know how to do that and we want to help you so when we sing this next song i'm going to invite you to come to one of the pastors and to talk with them and they'll be able to help you as you give your heart to christ today there might be many in this room who would say pastor you know, I, 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 the Lord has shown me there's some, somebody I, I need to make things right. I've not had the right attitude toward them. And uh, it's affected me in many ways. It may not just be your prayer life. It might be something else that's being affected by it. But in any case, it's not right. And God wants you to deal with that. Maybe you're here and you're saying, you know, Pastor, I, 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 need, I need help in getting through the circumstance I'm in loving God and loving others taking the high road following the example of Christ being willing to show sacrificial love practical love will help you be in the right place look actions change your feelings so take the action steps that will help you look bottom line is this you can't do it on your own it's a matter of dying to self and let Christ empower you to take those steps. Because that's where he gets the glory. If we could do that, you know, it wouldn't matter what I'm saying today. But when we die to self and we let Christ take over, not only does it happen, but he gets the glory. And that's what it's all about. There might be some that God is leading you to become part of our church family. Where we want to help you in your spiritual life and your spiritual growth and, and we believe that you'll be a blessing to us in that way as well so in just a moment when we sing I'm going to invite you to come as well maybe others want to pray here at the altar alone or you want someone to pray for you you come and we'll do that Father thank you for the truth of your word your word is truth as Jesus said and the Holy Spirit bears witness to that truth and it transforms our lives. Father, I pray you'll help these who need to make these commitments now. In Jesus' name, amen.